I want you to say this with me today, if you would. Say this. Can you hear it? Look at somebody right now and just ask them a question. Can you hear it? Psalm 103 gives us a a little bit of insight about God. It says that Moses knew the ways of God. Israel knew the works of God. Now, it's one thing to know the works of God. You can see what he's doing. The problem, however, with only knowing the works of God is that if God's not working, we don't think he's acting. And there's a lot of people, if they don't see God doing something, they'll get discouraged because they think that God has forgotten them, forgotten their prayers, left them out on their own. But Moses knew the ways of God. And when you know the ways of God, you don't have to see God do anything to understand that God is doing something. So here's what I believe before our very eyes. God, and it is God, it's not the devil. God is dismantling the religious and governmental structures that we have depended on. You say, we didn't ask for chaos and confusion. Oh, yes, we did. We have prayed along with thousands of others for God to do whatever it takes for a national awakening. But before you can have a supernatural awakening, there must be a supernatural deconstruction. A deconstruction of belief systems, governmental systems, church systems. Isaiah would put it like this. In chapter 40, he would say, prepare the way of the Lord. Now, the context of what he's referring to is when a king would travel from one country to another, from his country to visit another country. There was no road system. And so the preparation from getting a king from one location to another would oftentimes take years. It would require making a highway in the desert. It would require building up the valleys. It would require for mountains and hills to be torn down. And it also required that every crooked way had to be made straight so that the rough places... So the king could get from where he is to where he wants to go so that the king is able to get from one location to another. And and when Isaiah says this, everybody knew what he was referring to, but there's a greater goal here. It's not talking now about taking an earthly king from one location to another. It's talking about taking a heavenly king from his place in heaven to walk on this earth. But the only way that that happens is a deconstruction of what we have built. What's the goal of that? The goal is so the glory of the Lord can be revealed and all flesh can see it together. But things that are crooked have to be made straight. Why? What's the point of that? Because God is trying to prepare a place that can house the glory of God. The systems that we have built are incapable of housing the presence of God. So Jeremiah would say it like this, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms for what reason? To root out and to pull down. To destroy and to throw down. That happens first, then to build and to plant. 
If you want revival in your home, and really that's where revival, the outpouring of God's Spirit begins, it begins in your family. If you really want that to take place, then expect God to deconstruct your family before he can construct your home to house the presence of God. You say, wait a minute, I, I, I prayed and I asked God to do something with my husband, my wife, my kids, my, my family, and, and it, went, it went crazy. That's God. Because God has to deconstruct before he can reconstruct. Because what we have built, let me say it again, our church systems, our governmental systems, many of our business systems, they haven't, we built them, but they have not been built to be able to house the presence of God. So when you start praying and asking God, well, Lord, I need you to do something, then God will begin to deconstruct, and you will think it's chaos, but it's God. We thought we were praying about an election. God says we were praying about an intervention in the broken systems of a nation. Many of you know Andre Van Zyl. He's been here a number of times. He's from South Africa. South Africa had this massive prayer meeting a number of years ago. Multiple tens of thousands of people gathered together to pray for the nation, and the nation went into chaos. You've got to see what's going on here, folks. You have to understand that God is at work in this nation. You say, but I don't see it. That's the works of God. You have to understand the ways of God. Because everything God does in our lives is to deconstruct first so what He constructs can stay built. So let me just talk to you about something for a moment. Give me like two or three minutes. Maybe a little longer. <laughs> Somebody will accuse me of lying. How do I get there? How do I get there personally? How do I get there in my home? Because God's interested in your family. This is one of the reasons we're we're taking a lot of time this year to help your home, to help your family. Because if it doesn't happen there, it doesn't matter what happens here. So we, we've heard this before. And I want you to read this together with me. Let's just read this together. And afterward, that, that means everybody together, it's okay. We can do it together. It'll be fine. Here we go. And afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. So, so let's put this in context. Because we tend to go to the Bible and pull out scriptures and we make them what we, we want them to be. But let's talk about this for a moment because we won't understand this until we understand the context of the book. And afterward, pause. That means after something. I will pour, it's, it's not a sprinkle, it's a little pouring out my spirit on who? Okay, what God is wanting to do, you, you have all these words, well, God's going to move in this age group, and God's going to move in that age group. I just go back to the Bible. He says, all people. God's intent is to pour out his spirit on all people. 
your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Let me ask you a question. What if God isn't talking here about church? What if God is not speaking just about supernatural gifts, which are are certainly important? But what if God is talking about something outside of the church? Because when we read these scriptures, we all think about church. All people are going to be prophesying. There's going to be spiritual visions and people are going to be on the floor. Okay, that's all fine. But what if God is talking about something bigger than that? Because Peter on the day of Pentecost would quote this scripture as a fulfillment of of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But where was he when he was talking about it? He wasn't in the temple. He was outside of the temple. So what if God is trying to get our attention beyond church? Old men don't dream dreams. They're too old. Old men say, let let the younger generation do their thing. My time has passed. What if God is getting ready to do something that's out of season? What if God is getting ready to do something that shouldn't happen? What if we're not talking here just about spiritual dreams of revelation, but what if we're talking about ideas? What if we're talking about God putting dreams of businesses that are led by, inspired by God's Spirit, doctors, nurses, people in entertainment, people in the media, people in government. Some of you should be running for office. Please. We tell people to serve in church. We've got this down. We've got the church thing down. But but we've left the rest of the culture up to other people because we thought that, well, it wasn't necessary. If we just get the church thing down, we'll be good. Listen, I believe in this church there are people who have the ability to influence the world. Literally, I'm not, that's, that's not just sales talk. I believe that within this house, God has dreams with inside of you, thoughts and visions that aren't about just church. It's about influencing the culture. Let me ask you a question. How many people does it take to influence and change culture? And we say, wow, we're going to have mass conversions. Well, we, I believe in that. But it doesn't take very many people to shift the thinking in a culture. Let me prove it to you. Take the LGBTQ community. Less than 3% of the population actually identifies with that, and yet entire nations are bowing to that agenda. Why? A very few people in high positions with money have shifted the perspective of a culture. What would happen? If there were people, godly people, that said, I don't just want to go to church, but in business, education, family, the arts, entertainment, science, medicine, and government, what would happen if some of those people got in position? It doesn't take a lot of people. It takes a handful of godly people in high positions with influence. The potential of it is that they could shift the culture. What if God is talking about the culture here, not just church? What if he's saying that on my servants, men and women, I'm going to pour out my spirit in those days to actually shift the perspective of a nation. Now, how does it happen? One of the the amazing things about the Bible is that it's the most relevant book that's ever been written. It's not... 2,000, 5,000, 7,000 year ago history, it's relevant to today. So put this scripture in the context of the book of Joel. The 
The context of the book of Joel is not about the Holy Spirit. Joel doesn't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit except that verse. The context of the book, and afterward, after something, the context of the book is about a locust plague, the judgment of God that came across Israel in the form of a plague. Now, you're an agricultural country. The worst thing that could happen is for a locust plague. And, and, and you, can, you can look at what's gone on in South Africa recently. This is in the news. Don't, don't look it up right now because we've shut down the Internet so you can't get on your phones. I'm kidding. <laughs> Y'all lighten up a little bit, okay? <laughs> we don't want control over the Internet like some people. Read what's going on in some of these nations that have had locust plagues that have swept across their land. It destroys everything. And when you're an agricultural society, if you don't have the crops, you can't live. And so Joel begins to talk about a plague. In their case, it was locusts. A plague that starts sweeping across the land. So watch this. Watch this with me. What's, what's the first thing that Joel was saying? Joel chapter 1, he, he, he identifies and says, Hear this, you elders. Look at somebody and say, Can you hear this? Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? I said to my mother, who was 93, and my 96 or 97-year-old uncle, who's really sharp, I said, you ever seen anything like this? I asked them both. They said, oh, we've never seen anything like this. Tell it to your children. Let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. It would be something so cataclysmic in a generation that it would be a story to tell four generations. And then Joel will say this, What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the four stages of a locust from birth to adulthood. As it started in the land, it was a baby locust. And then it would grow as it would eat. And by the time the plague was over with, it would be an adult locust. Listen to me. We are in stage one of the plague. D don't be scared of that. Because if you understand the ways of God, you can see the end of what God wants to do. Notice what takes place when, when, when a plague, and in their case a locust plague, comes across. Four things happen in the middle of a plague. Number one, worship stops. Can I just tell you something? Verse 9, grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. Over the last number of months, we have seen people from a pastoral perspective, we have seen people fall off the rails. The presence of God is challenged. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails, olive oil representing the Holy Spirit. The presence of God becomes challenged. Then conversion sees the harvest of the field is destroyed. People wonder where God is at. Let me just say something to you. Just because something's not happening in your corner doesn't mean God's not at work. So don't, don't base what God is doing upon your own experience. Take a look at the big picture and see God at work. And then for a lot of people, when the plague happens, joy disappears. Surely the people's joy is withered away. So, so what does God say to do through the prophet Joel? We all want to get to Joel chapter 228, but that's way down the road from this book. Because it doesn't start with 228. I mean, everybody would say, I want God to do something great in my home. I want my family to be fixed. I want this struggle to be gone, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How do we get there?
Joel will reveal to us this simple process. Here's the first step. There's a call to repentance. Now, let me just say this. I know we go, okay, yeah, well, I just checked out because I don't even know about that stuff. I need you to listen to me. We are not, in, in, in the South, we're not in the Bible belt, by the way. We're in the religious belt. We've been taught, you get a profession of faith, you're good. Whatever happened to living a lifestyle of brokenness and repentance before the Lord? This isn't a one-time thing. And he says, this is what the Lord says, turn to me now while there's still time. Give me your hearts. The implication here is their time will run out at some point. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, mourning. Who loves to fast? You are right. <laughs> that pastor just loves to fast. He needs therapy. No, I don't like to fast. <laughs> I told you the other week, we don't fast because we're spiritual. We fast because we're not. <laughs> Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning over our sin. So I don't have any great sins. Great sin? What about our anger? What about our pride? What about our thoughts? What about our tongues? He says, don't tear your clothing and your grief, but tear your hearts. Don't do something outward. Do something inward. Return to the Lord your God. He's merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He's eager to relent and not punish. Isn't that the grace of God? Who knows? Maybe if we call on the Lord, He'll give us a reprieve, sending us a blessing instead of a curse. Do you know what I believe? I, maybe I'm just, just silly to believe this. I believe if the body of Christ would fall in brokenness in, across America, would fall in brokenness and repentance right now, we could put a stop to all of this mess in a moment if the church would just really call out to God. And, and not be asking for themselves, not some selfish prayer, God, fix this in me, fix my family, fix this. God, help my headache, help my toes. Get humble before God and say, God, we got to have your help in this nation. We can put a stop to this mess now. This is, this is, I mean, is, 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 am I misinterpreting what is being said here? Is God trying to talk to, to a nation? And he says, this blow the ram's horn in Jerusalem. Blow the ram's horn in the capital. Amen. Announce a time of fasting, not marching, fasting. I'm afraid that our politics has taken over our relationship with God, and we don't know the difference between the two. You can upset with me if you want to. I don't care. <laughs> Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting of brokenness. Gather all the people, the elders, the children, even the babies. Call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room. That's their wedding night. Shift everything. Change your schedule. Let the priests who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep between the entry room to the temple and the altar and let them pray, God, spare your people. Don't let your special possession become an object of mockery. Watch this. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners. Don't let the world be looking at this nation as a joke. Where's their God? Can, can, look, look at somebody and say, can you hear this? 
here's, here's, here's the second thing that happens. He says, if there's repentance, if there's repentance, if there's a call to repentance, God moves it to a call to restoration. Then the Lord will pity His people and jealously guard the honor of His land. After repentance, then restoration the Lord will reply, look, I'm sending you grain and new wine and olive oil enough to satisfy your needs. You'll no longer be an object of mockery among the surrounding nations. Do, do you understand this? You'll no longer be an object of mockery among the surrounding nations. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Now, what's he talking about here? The former rain was the hard pounding rain in the spring that would break up the hard ground. It would pound. It was hard rains. Then the planting would begin and the, the sowing and the, the getting the seed in the ground. Then months later, the latter rain would come, which was the soft rains that would bring the final growth of the harvest. Notice what he says here. I'm going to do the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. In other words, I'm going to do something so quick, if you're not ready for it, you're going to miss it. He says, I'm going to do something totally out of season because I'm going to do planting and harvest all at the same time. And then he says this. I'll give you back what you lost. There's likely those of us in this room that have lost some things over the last number of years. The King James Version will put it like this. I'll restore to you the years the locust has eaten. There are some things in your life that the locust has eaten over a number of years. Financially, it's been eaten. Spiritually, it's been eaten. Morally, it's been eaten. Physically, emotionally, it's been eaten. And you take a look at your history over the last number of years and you, you, you try to get ahead and at the moment you try to get ahead, it, it's somebody, it's gone. And you try again, you, it's like you're climbing up the mountain and about the time you get to the top, somebody pushes you back down again. God says, I'm going to restore to you everything that you have lost. I'm going to give it back to you. This is the, the restoration of God and and once again, you'll have all the food you want. You'll praise the Lord your God who does these miracles for you. Never again will my people be disgraced. Then you will know that I am among my people Israel. Then you'll know that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. Never again will my people be disgraced. Look at somebody and say, can you hear this? Some of us have lived so long in loss that we don't believe it could ever be restored, I'm telling you that after repentance comes restoration, then Joel chapter 2 comes a revival. Restoration is not revival. Restoration is the preparation for revival. Repentance is the tearing down of what we have constructed. Listen to me. We have constructed mindsets. We have constructed ways of thinking. We have constructed attitudes. The battle right now, folks, is the battle for the way people think. in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of people lest they should believe the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What are strongholds? We think strongholds are some demon sitting out here holding on to somebody. He says, casting down imaginations and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. What, what is a stronghold? It is a way of thinking that is opposed to God's way of thinking. 
You say, well, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. I guess I don't have to worry about that. Guess again. Because a lot of us have been brought up in religious systems that have caused us to think incorrectly. It's happened within our own families. We, we, we learn from our families. We learn from our friends. And we've created all of these structures and ways of thinking. And we wonder why we cannot get a breakthrough is because we have to shift the way we are thinking. The battle is for the mind. The battle is the way that we think. And when God tears all of that down, if we will let God tear it down, some of you don't know what's going on in your life. You say, well, I just, you know, it's a little chaotic right now. And I don't know why that's going on. And I don't know what that's going on. Well, it's the devil. The devil is after me. In my, in my, my church back home many years ago, people get up and we used to let people get up in a worship service and stand up and testify. Do you all remember that? Whoo, that's dangerous. <laughs> I want to do that in this church. You want to say something, you come talk to one of us and we'll see if you got sense. <laughs> the devil's been on my back all week long. You no, know, Sister Sally stands up. <laughs> the devil's been on my back all week long. And my response is, you know what? I highly doubt that with who you are, the devil much cares about what you're doing. If he's going to spend his time doing something, he's going, to, he's going to go to somebody that really has some influence in prayer and with people. You say, I don't like that. Look at me. Every soul is valuable, but not every soul has the same influence. We don't want to hear that. If the devil's going to bother somebody, then it's going to be somebody that has some kingdom influence. Not the devil's been on my back all week long, and I gossiped about everybody all week long. The devil already has you, sweetheart. He doesn't have to pay attention to you. I just dug a hole. I got to dig back out of it again. <laughs> then revival. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Then repentance restoration, and revival. Not here. Sure, we want that. But it's not a revival if the city doesn't know what's going on. We had such a revival service, it was great. Did the city know? Nobody in the city knew what was going on. It was just a bunch of us Christians having a good time together. I'll pour out my spirit on all people, everybody, not just one age group. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Your old men will dream dreams, and don't miss this. Your young men will see visions. In order for that young man to see his vision, that old man must dream his dream because God never intended for the generations to be separated. He intended them to be united because when I'm dreaming, they can see their vision. It's not one or the other. It's both. I, I don't understand that generation. I don't understand their music. My, my mother said to me one time, I was probably 15 years old. I remember this. I, she loved country and western music. Anybody ever heard of Charlie Pride? He just passed away. Okay, you're looking at me like, I don't know who that is. It's good. Um, Conway Twitty. Anybody know who that is? Oh, y'all are showing yourself now. Okay. Merle Haggard. We need a prayer meeting right now. I was listening to this station. It was all contemporary, top 40 stuff. We were in the car, and she said, oh, that music you listen to. So after I had kids, the kids were listening to something in the car, and I said to them, what is that music? And then I remembered. I said, oh, no, no, this is not good. I made a mistake in the first service. I said, anybody know what a Helen is? It's not a Helen, it's a Karen. 
sheesh. What's a Karen? Everybody know what a Karen is? You know, it's it, in, in the language. We don't always understand the language. It's like, what's up? What's up? It's not one or the other. What is he saying here? He's saying we're not going to lose another generation. Let me just say this to you. I've been in this church 20 years this month. We've lost generations. God is saying, you're not going to lose one more. Because I am going to pour out my spirit, and they will never doubt who I am again. So that, that, that's what God's saying. This is why God wants to move within your home, within your family. So if we're trying to help your family this year because we recognized what good is it if something happens here if it's not happening in the home? I heard this story about a man who, he went shopping with his wife, and, which men just love to do, and, and uh, he disappeared. She didn't know where he was at. She calls him, and she says, where, where, where are you at? He says, honey, remember that jewelry store we went by the other day? She said, yes. Remember that ring we looked at? And I said, one day it's going to be yours. She said, yes. He said, I'm at the coffee shop beside the jewelry store. (laughs) Listen, I'm declaring over your family a Holy Ghost outpouring in 2021. I'm declaring over your marriage. I'm declaring over your children restoration, marriage restoration. I'm declaring that the things that you thought you have lost, God is going to come back. But it begins with repentance. He will move it to restoration. It will end in revival. And God is deconstructing everything that cannot house His glory. Don't fret that because when He's done deconstructing, He will reconstruct and your life will never be the same. I want you to slip your hands toward the Lord for just a moment right now. Come on. Come on, slip your hands toward the Lord. Just just kind of hold them out toward the Lord, and we're going to believe God together. Father, in Jesus' name. We're in significant need of you today. Our nation needs you, Lord, but we're the ones to influence the nation. Right from here, God, we're the ones to influence in every avenue of our culture, God. So God, I pray in this room today, you'll raise up people in business, in media, in the entertainment world, in the arts world, in the education world, in the government world, God. I pray, God, that you will hear us, hear you giving us permission to move beyond just church. For an influence in our culture, God, It goes beyond Sunday morning. Lord, I pray in this moment for the dreams of God to well up with inside of us. I pray that we'll see visions of the potential of what you want to do within us. God, Kickstart us, God. Give us a spiritual crowd funding, Lord. And natural funding, Lord. To be able to do what you have put within our hearts, God. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to deconstruct so that you can reconstruct. No longer will we accept things the way that they are. 
We will lean into your promises, God. We will hope in your promises. We will believe your promises, God. And we will trust that every struggle, I speak over addictions in this moment. May the presence of the Lord move aside your addiction. I speak over sickness in this room. Be healed in Jesus' name. We speak over confusion. May your mind be made clear in Jesus' name. We speak over loss. And ye, we hear your voice saying to us, you are going to restore us. In Jesus' name, as your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. You're in this room. The Holy Spirit's already talked to you about a relationship with Jesus. You say, yeah, that's what I need. Pray this prayer. Everybody in the room, pray this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I turn my life over to you. I want to live for you every day. I turn from my sin and commit my life to you. In Jesus' name. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. How many of you just prayed that prayer with me? You said, yes, that's for me. I know I need the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Who else in the room today? Let me see your hands. Just put them up. Thank you. Who else in the room? That, that, that was for me. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 